This is Power Forward. All right, welcome back to Power Forward. Justin White alongside Mateen Cleves. Mateen, how you doing, my friend? Hey, Justin, baby, I am flying high. I can't lose. It's all good. Let's go, baby. Well, um, this this episode today, Mateen, I, I know is going to be uh, real special to you because I know how big you are on giving back to the community. Uh, and, and our guest today, you know, he has just done some incredible things uh, for kids in the city of Detroit. Uh, he also, by the way, has an incredible personal story that we're going to have him share with us. Uh, but we are very pleased to be welcomed by Kali Sweeney. He is the founder and CEO of the Downtown Boxing Gym in Detroit, Michigan. Kali, great to see you and thanks so much for joining us on Power Forward. Thanks for having me on. So just for starters, uh, give our listeners an idea of, of what the Downtown Boxing Gym is. I know that you guys have been at this since 2007, so uh, yeah. you're into your second decade now, but, but give our audience an idea of, of what it is you guys do. So we're after we're after school program. It's uh, pretty much reading inter- intervention, math intervention, a lot of mentorship. We do a lot of enrichment programming, STEAM lab, um, uh, meals, free transportation to and from school. Uh, yeah, we pretty much provide a lot of services, sports sampling, and of course, uh, health and wellness type stuff and uh, social emotional stuff too going on down there. Oh man, man! That, woo, man all, free, I, I, all free of cost too. <laughs> oh, I was born at the wrong time. Oh my God, I wish I could have taken advantage of something like that growing up. And uh, you know, I just asked because you t- it was a lot of stuff that you said. Boom, you hit on, but mentorship um, okay. that caught my attention, man, because I know that's super valuable uh, in our inner cities, not only in Michigan but throughout the, you know across the country, man. Um, how you know? what's the, the big deal about that? You know, how, how did you guys go about the mentorship? No, no, just can you talk about how oh, yeah, important yeah. mentorship is to these young kids growing up? Definitely, definitely, definitely. And my story was my story was a, a was a hard luck story pretty much. You know, everybody told me I would be dead or in jail before I was 21. Nobody mm-hmm. ever told me the, the possibilities, the limited, limitless possibilities that were out there for me. Nobody encouraged me to, to chase my dreams. Nobody encouraged me to do anything you know, other than you're not going to even be able to work at the fast food restaurant or be a garbage man. You're never going to amount to anything. It was what I was always told. So, you know, it took one day for somebody to sit me down and say, you do know the rest of the world doesn't live like this. You do know this, you know, this death and destruction is only in this little pocket that you can get outside of this pocket. You can become more and bring something back to your community. So that meant a lot to me. It changed my life and it changed my direction. So of course, I want to do the same thing for other young people in my situation. I want to, I want to be that voice of, to tell them that, you know, this is not a permanent situation. This can be changed. You can alter your course. You know, all it's going to take is to commit yourself to something that's, you know, it may be slow in the beginning, but it's going to have a long lasting influence on your neighborhood, your community, yourself, your family. And that's what I did. Mentorship is, is key. Somebody giving you that positive push. You know, Kelly, I've heard you brought a lot of things up so far. Um, but, but, you know, I really haven't heard much about boxing. And I'm sure you get this question all the time because, you know, it is the downtown boxing gym yeah. youth program. Uh, but, you know, I know that it, the, uh, the motto has always been books before boxing. So right. kind of walk us through how that evolved and, and why, um, you know, boxing is certainly a piece of the program, but it is most certainly not the, the top priority. Okay, so how it came about was, you know, one of the first things I did when I learned how to read was, uh, you know, I, I didn't learn how to read and write through school. I didn't learn how to read and write until I was an adult. And so one of the things, one of the things that I did was um, I, I read something where it said you can find out more about a person in an hour of play than you can a lifetime of questions. So you can ask all the questions in the world, but you can find out more about a person in an hour of play than a lifetime of questioning. So I said, what does that hour of play look like to me? What does that hour of play look like? And I was like, well, I can't play basketball. I can't play baseball. I can't play any other sports. But I said, I do have this one skill. I learned how to box when I was younger. The, 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 um, the amount of concentration that it took and the amount of discipline that it took, you know, I, I could teach this sport. So I started working with the kids with the boxing. Then I would ask them, well, how was your day? Well, how is school? You know, can you read or write? I, I would just ask them, hey, man, could you read or write? Man, read this to me, man. I'm having trouble reading this. And I would find out more about people like that. So boxing is, was like the character to bring the kids in. Plus, it's easier to get a kid to a boxing gym than it is to get a kid to an after-school reading and writing program. You know, if you say you're going to a boxing gym, your friends are most likely going to come down with you because they want to see what's going on. 
But when they get there, it's my rules. You know, books before boxing. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> never take hey. you doing my books. Golly, I love it, baby. That's how you do it, man. And um, it's funny, man. I, I used to give a free basketball cap, and that was my thing. Basketball was the draw, baby. Yeah. And once we get you there, it's on, oh, man. We're gonna teach you <laughs> about so much, so many different things in life. And so I, I love it, man. And um, is, is it? Do you notice, like, once you get kids there, and then? Um, once you get them there, you start talking about the books and everything like that. Is are they like, oh man, I, I just came to box? You know what I mean? You know, what's the interaction? How are, how are the kids accepting that? You know what you said? You nailed it. You you nailed it right on the head too. It's like, hey man, I just want to box, <laughs> but I'm sorry, that's not how it's going to work around here. <laughs> Let me explain to you the reason. Let me explain to you how many people actually make it in sports. So what happened to those other people who don't make it in sports? Mm-hmm. What happened to those guys? And then I say, well, let me show you. Let's go for a ride. I'll, I put them in my car. We get in a van and we go to some of the places around town where people are not doing so well. We point it out. We say, man, listen, you have to have a game plan. You have to have a plan for life. You know, this has to be your education has to be plan A, not plan B. Education has to be plan A, not plan B. We don't want you to get so far down the line and realize that you might not be able to make it or cut it in a particular area. And then you got to try and fall back. Oh, I'm going to get my education now. Now the world kept going now. Everything done bypassed you now. It's a hard time to catch up. I know. I spent 20 years chasing that. You know, for the 20 years that I missed in school, it took me 20 years to even get to a place where I could comfortably read, basically fill out an application. It's hard to even fill out job applications, man. So I'm not going to keep up with my counterparts, man. I'm barely reading a job application. I'm the low end on the totem pole. I'm the guy that's putting, I'm the guy that's picking the tables up, throwing it in the garbage, putting the plates and throwing them in the garbage. You know what I mean? I'm the guy that's sweeping the curb. So it's kind of hard, you know? You know, you know, Kali, you, you've mentioned a few things about, you know, your background and your upbringing, um, you know, and, and I want you to kind of dive a little bit deeper into it, going all the way back to when you were born, because, you know, the, the things you have been through, uh, I'm sure you, you bring them up as lessons uh, to, to these kids that you're working with, you know, because you can put yourself in, the, in their shoes. Um, so, so, you know, give us uh, the, the, the full story of, of you know, okay. where you started and how you've gotten to where you are now. So with me, it was, uh, you know, my mother, like a lot of people, and my mother and father, like a lot of people back in the uh, 60s and 70s, you know, they, they were going through some issues of their own. And um, I ended up with my grandfather, and he was a working man. He was a single working man by himself, and he, he, he would leave me with this lady who lived in the neighborhood. He would leave me with her, and so he would have to come back and pick me up late at night. And so it'd be like so late. And then he would be right back up at work in the morning again. He was, you know, so the lady was like, listen, just leave him here. And then we'll just work it like that. And, you know, and so I ended up being raised by a family that I wasn't related to. You know, that had a lot of, it came with a lot of emotional stuff that came with that. You know what I mean? So when I went to school, I just had this super chip on my shoulder, but nobody at school ever asked me what was going on in my life. Nobody took the time to listen, to ask me what was going on. And, you know, by the third grade, I realized I couldn't read or write. And so I would just act out. I would deflect, you know, if you pass me a book, I would just spaz out. And the school system was more than welcome to just send me home without asking me any questions. But they would tell me all the time, I would be dead, or you're gonna be in jail, or you're not gonna be able to work as a garbage man. You're not gonna be able to work in a fast food restaurant. Nobody ever took the time to ask me what's going on. Nobody took the time to listen. And so before you know it, I was in the 12th grade and I was still getting good grades. I was being passed along. How did I even make it to the, to the fourth grade? How did I make it to the fifth grade? How did I make it to any of these grades? How did I make it to high school? And so one day I just listened. I just was thinking to myself, I said, man, you know what? I'm going to be dead in jail before I'm 21 anyway. I might as well just get out here and go crazy. So I just went out here, started walking the streets and, you know, some guy took me in and was like, hey, you know, come hang out with us. And before you know it, I was on a bad path and I was on a bad path for a long time. I was shot. You know, I've seen a lot of friends die young, seen a lot of friends get indicted and go to prison. Seen a lot of a lot of bad things in my life. And like I said, one day, you know, a family member came to me and said, you know, you know, the rest of the world don't live like this. Your neighborhood is death and destruction. There's no resources in your community. There's nothing positive going on. You know, what is it that you want to do? And the only thing that I could think of, and I tell people this all the time, I could he, and he showed me a picture of all my friends. He said, Look at this picture we took on your porch. We were going Pontiac skating this time. He said, Look at these pictures, all these guys. He just started naming. He's dead, he's dead, he's in prison, he's in prison. Mm-hmm. Don't be the next guy on this picture. Don't you be the next guy on the picture. What do you want to do? And the only thing I can think of, and I tell people this all the time, it's funny. I thought of Jackie Chan. <laughs> I thought of Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan said, this is what he said. 
They asked him, they said, you made $50 million off this movie, Jackie Chan, and he didn't look excited. The guy was like, well, what do you say to a guy? And Jackie Chan said, I make $50 million off every movie. Every mm -hmm. movie I make, I make $50 million. They said, well, what do you say to a guy that make $50 million? What would make you happy? He said, if I knew how to read. Wow. And that's what was in my mind, if I knew how to read. See, in my mind, I was, I was always, like Jackie Chan say, I want to be the leading man. I'm always the comic relief, or I'm always fighting. That's what he was doing. I was fighting or cracking jokes. I crack jokes and be ready to fight. Mm. I crack a joke. You can laugh with me or we can fight. I was with both of them. I was with it. You know what I mean? But all the time I was hurting inside. I was, I was hurt. I was crushed. Not knowing how to read is the loneliest place in the world. I tell you, you can have all the money in the world. You can have all the friends in the world. But if you cannot read, you are lonely. It's a mm. crushing, hurting place to be. And it'll destroy you inside. It'll make you just numb. And so, yeah. I went back to school after I thought about the Jackie Chan stuff. I said, where do I want to be? What do I want to do? I made a choice and a promise in my life, and I moved on. I went to a night school, and I changed my life. I started teaching myself how to read. I started going to night school. I started picking up every bit of books or anything I could find, any type of material, and I just sought out help wherever I could find it. I got a job. I never looked back, and one day I was just at work, and I said to myself, like, man, you know, I've made it to a place where I'm comfortable. I got a job. I'm making almost $30 an hour. You know, I brought myself up. I, I cut all my old friends and I have no bad, no bad blood out here in these streets. I, everything is positive right now in my life. But that's my accomplishment. That's one accomplishment for me. How do I help the rest of the community? What do I do to help everybody else? Because I see a whole lot of people going on that same path as me. So I just I walked off my job. I walked off <laughs> my job, became homeless. <laughs> I walked off my job. I opened up the gym. I went from 218 solid muscle down to about 130 pounds. Uh, from solid muscle, about to 130 pounds. Uh, I, I lost my car, my house, and I just kept putting everything into the gym. Just kept standing. I would just, when, whenever I, when I had my car, whenever it would work, it would break down. I would walk, and the parents would see me walking in the snow, and the parents would try to pick me up. And then the kids started saying, do you live in that car? And so, you know, are you living inside the gym? And so that's how I was, you know, for a long time. And then the community heard about us. And, and Detroit is a great place. And some of the surrounding area, great place, great people. People just started reaching out and it started growing from there. So, I mean, I thank the community for that. Wow, man. I, man, I love and respect your resiliency, man. And this is the first podcast that I'm going to encourage our listeners to sit down with your kids and listen to this one because this is be beneficial for not only you, but your kids as well. And, and, you, and, and, and that your story, man, your story is so powerful. And let me ask you this question because what I notice a lot in the inner city communities is kids using um, excuses, meaning my mother is not, my mother is on jail. She's not, I mean, uh, on drugs. She's not capable. My father is not in my life. So I, you know, I don't have any, I should, you know, I, they, they use it as an excuse. Okay, now, Kali, I'm a fly on the wall in your yeah. office, and I got a kid sitting there telling you, hey, you know, this is why, man, I don't have a father in my life. What is the conversation that you have with that kid? Well, for me, I mean, first I would just listen to him and hear him out. I would mm -hmm. hear what he's saying because that, that's, a valid, that's a valid point. You, you mm -hmm. know, everybody needs somebody in their life. Yeah. And that's when you say that's why these doors right here are open. We're here to listen to you. We're here to take the place, not to take the place, but be a substitute for right now. Your mother, father, they might pull it together at some point in time, but right now, I'm here right now. And we're giving you all the opportunity you need right now and all the support you need right now. All I need you to do is meet me halfway. Meet me halfway. Let's do this thing together. Let's walk this path together. You know what I mean? Your, your destiny is not written stone yet. Let's, let's walk this path together. Then now you can go back. You might can help your father out in his situation. You may be able to help your mother out in her situation. But it all takes time. And so it ain't going to happen overnight. It's something that we got to work for. And I'm, I'm here to help you work through this. So I love it. Most guys, most guys will hear that and they'll come on in. I love it. I love it. And, and the thing is, you know, now you can learn, you know, if you have people around you doing stuff that's not quite so right, now you know what not to do. You okay. know what I mean? Now embrace it and make it make it a better way. So I, I love what you're doing because I see it and I notice kids that use, uh, and like you said, it's a very valid excuse, but your story, you made it, Kali. Now, if anybody got an excuse, you have one. You know what, though? You know what? It's like, man, you know, it takes people to actually see it and hear it. You have to first show them, show it to them. You have to show it to them. You know, some people are not aware of some of the things that they do. They're not aware of some of the excuses that they make. They're not aware because that's their reality in that moment. Somebody had to show me that you do know the rest of the world don't live like this. 
And I was in my mind, I was like, man, go back to where you from. This is how it is. And then, you know what I'm saying? He, he literally said, you need to get out and look around and see. So with our kids, we take them on field trips. We go places. We make sure they interact with, with doctors, lawyers, and engineers. We make sure that they get a chance to go to places. And, and well, like, like I said, we do enrichment programming where they might do mock trials at the federal courthouse, where they might, where they might decide that I don't want to be on this side of the law. I want to be on that side of the law. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor. We want to shadow professionals in their in they work, you know what I mean, in the workplace. So they got to have opportunity to do that. And so that's what we try to do. We provide the opportunities for kids to get out and see different things. Because if you're in that little bubble, you don't see it. Love it. So, so currently, Kali, you know, the, the, the after school program has 150 plus students uh, who, are, who are a part of it. Mateen, check this out. There are more than 1,300 students that are currently on the wait list. So there, there are so many kids out there that want to be a part of this, Kali. Um, how, how do you kind of come to grips with that, if you will? Um, the fact that you're helping so many kids, you helped so many kids in the time you've been doing this, but there are so many more um, who would love to be a part of this. So a lot, a, lot of, uh, a lot of what's going on is like, you know, they hear about us having a 100% graduation rate. A lot of our kids go on to college and, and higher education and, uh, you know, trade schools and stuff like that. So, of course, no, that's no, wait, 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 wait. A hundred percent graduation rate. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, you come to our program, you graduate no time. We set, up oh. a, we set up a program for you. We got some of the best teachers. And like, you know, a lot of people say like, oh, Kali, you did this, you did that. No, it's our team. We have a team of great teachers, uh, tutors and volunteers. And people who come in and work with our kids and just create a, a program around the kid. And the kid, him or herself, you know, just around them and embrace them to help them get to where they are. So, so. You know, we we have a 100% graduation rate, and 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 you know, getting the kids to and from our program is is a big thing too. You know, getting them there that's a big. You know, as far as the waiting list goes, you know, we have a wait list, but a large part of the wait list is kids can't get to the program. You know, we provide transportation to our program to and from school or from home, and so we only have a limited amount of space on the vans that we have, and you know. The reason that we're successful is that the kids are able to come to the program consistently. They have consistent access to computers. They have consistent access to support. They have consistent access to resources, you know, that's provided for them at no cost. So, you know, some of these guys, you know, you might be at home and they might have one phone that everybody's trying to get on this one phone for the computer to do their work. That's, that's impossible. It's not going to happen. You know what I mean? Sometimes the parents have to work two or three jobs just to keep the lights on. You know what I mean? So they have to be able to get to a place where they can be safe until the parents get off work. So, yeah. So that's you know, I, I, I got, I got to ask you, you know, because a lot of our listeners, you know, are entrepreneurs, um, aspiring entrepreneurs, small business owners, and it's a struggle. I mean, people say all the time, you know, it, it's, it's one thing to actually start the business, but it's, it's a lot harder to actually grow it um, and have it, you know, maintain success over the long haul, that, that longevity that everybody's looking for. You talked about the fact that, you know, you were basically living in your car, just basically piecing things together to try and get this, this idea at the gym together. So yeah. what, was the, what was the turning point? You know, how did you, um, you know, turn that corner uh, and really start to see the program take off? What was, what was the key for you as you look back on that time? So, so the, key, the key to the thing for me was this. It was like, you know, I was 100% committed to it. I was 100% committed to it. I had already given up everything for it and I was going to continue to give up everything for it because I believe what we were doing was worth it. You know, we didn't need to see another group of kids, you know, go to prison. We didn't have, need to see another group of kids go off the, to the county morgue. You know what I'm saying? So I was wholeheartedly committed to it. So I just put in the work. And so with that, it drew a lot of attention and a lot of people saw the work that I was doing. And so people started asking questions. And when they started asking questions, you know, people, once they start asking questions, then they start coming around and then they started opening up their networks and then they opened up that network would open up another network of people. So then we started getting volunteers and volunteers and, you know, we had a good person, our, our academic director, I mean, not our academic director, our director, our program director, uh, Jessica Hauser, you know, she jumped all in 100% and she committed all her resources and access to her network and people. Well, let me, let me dive back in because I, I, I understand, man, when you don't have the resources, how tough it can be when you're trying to build something that, would, that you're doing and uh, your vision and 
Um, you hit a little bit on it, but I want you to talk a little bit more how 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 important networking is, man. You know what I mean? How 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 was that able to help you continue to drive and strive and, and, and see your dreams come to fruition? Um, networking was the key, honestly. Networking was the key. I mean, honestly, you know, um, you know, I, I hear people say this word a lot, founder syndrome where you have this founder syndrome where you think that you have to do every single thing. And if you think that you can do every single thing, you possibly can at some point in time, but you know, it's going to crush you. But if you let, a, if you let more people in more hands on the problem, the lighter to lift, the more hands on the problem, the lighter to lift. And you know, I was, I had founder syndrome for a long time. That's how I ended up homeless. That's how I ended up, you know, uh, 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 uh losing so much weight because I was so, I was so close to it that I didn't even realize that I needed help. And there was people offering to help and I would just brush them off. You know, I would brush them off. I, I was just using every resource at my disposal and it wasn't enough. And I was actually killing the organization. I was actually killing the mission and myself in the process. And it took for me to be open-minded, to be open to other ideas and be open to other networks and to reach out and say, look, I need help. Because if I want to help these kids, I got to help. I need help to do it. I can't do it all by myself. So the networking was the biggest thing. It saved the organization. It saved the mission. It saved, you know, a lot of kids' lives. But you know what? I, let me, I'm going to jump in here because I know what you were thinking. See, you wasn't just thinking. Uh, the, the thing was you wanted people to be involved who was as serious as about that that <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah, I know. You are, yeah, I know. Yeah. I, mean, I, yeah. <laughs> I know what it was. It wasn't yeah. like, okay, I don't want the help. I don't need it. It's like, I want to make sure if, if yeah. people are involved with this, they are serious as I am to helping yeah. these kids in this community. Correct. Because the last thing you want to, to somebody to do, so you might have a kid here who haven't even opened up to me. And he find that one person that he opens up to, he opens up to this person, and then tomorrow this guy's gone. See, I don't want some fly-by-night guys. You know, even to, even to work in our facility, we asked you. I asked guys personally. I don't care what the whole interview process is. I have one question for you. What brought you here today? What happened in your life that brought you here today? <laughs> what brought you here today? Because this is not some corporate ladder that you're about to climb. This is a mission. We're on a mission together, but there's no corporate ladder to climb. We have a mission, but there's no corporate ladder. So why are you here today? Wow. If you can't tell me why you're here today and give me a good reason, then I don't, I don't care what your credentials say. Because, you know, that your credentials can take you anywhere. And tomorrow you can be gone. But I need to know why you're committed to the people right now, to the kids, to the community. <laughs> and and to, to piggyback off of that point, Kali, you know, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, number one, I want you to tell us, you know, describe yourself as a leader. I want to know what, what you know, other people would say about you um, as the leader of the organization. Um, also, though, how you became so comfortable um, as the leader and as the face of the downtown boxing gym coming from a place where you were, like you said, where you were um, a kid who didn't know how to read, an adult who didn't know how to read. And now, look, you're doing all these interviews. Um, you're, you're the face of the organization. So, um, Number one, walk us through your leadership style and then tell us how you kind of became comfortable uh, in a position of leadership. So as, as, a, as the leader of an organization, the first thing to be in a leader is to be a good follower and to know what you don't know and, be, and, and to know what you don't know. It's people on your team that are way smarter than you. And if you feel like that you got to have the last word on everything, then your business is going to fail because there's a, you hired these people for a reason. They possess some skills. And if you're not willing to listen to these guys and really sit down and have an open dialogue with these guys, your business is going to fail. I surround myself with people who are smarter than me all the time. I know when to be quiet. I know when to be a leader. And I also remain neutral. I try to remain neutral that way, as neutral as possible, so I can see both ends of the, of the, of the gambit. You know what I mean? I want to see both ends. I want to hear what's in, in between. You know, I want to find out the best and correct path to go down. And I take the advice of my people that's around me. That's why they're around me. And so they make me comfortable. My team makes me comfortable. Man, that's, wow. And, and, and it's funny to, not funny, but it's, it's, it's encouraging, man, to hear you talk about a team. Because every, and I say this on some of our podcasts, like every successful person, you know, when they go up there, they get an award. It's like, you know, I want to thank my team. You know, people think it's just them. It could be a, a rapper. It could be a, 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 a guy in the movies. It could be entertainer. It could be an athlete. 
they always talk about the team, man. And, um, you know, just in that, can you talk about, go a little more in depth about how important having a good group of people is around you when you're trying I mean, to build what you're building? I mean, it's paramount. I mean, it's, it, this, that, having a good team is crucial. Everybody has to buy in. Every, everybody has to be on the same page. You cannot be working in some sort of silo. You know, we can't have these different agendas. We all have to be on board, and we got to have, put the mission first. We have to put the mission first, and the mission is the kids and our community. At the end of the day, you know, we, we're, sending, we're sending these kids off into the future, to the 25th century and beyond. We have to make sure that we're giving them all the tools they need to be successful. That, that, can't, that, that can't happen if you bring in some old baggage from over here, from over there. You bring in your different agenda and all this type. It doesn't work like that, man. It has to be a team effort. Team is the most important thing when you're trying to do this kind of work right here. We have to be a team. We have to be on the same page. I, I want to tap in a little bit with your connection with the kids. And some, some in me seems like it's some of these kids, you say, hey, man, I was you. You know what I mean? Because, you know, me coming from the inner city, you know, and going back to talking to kids, and sometimes they look at me, well, you know, sometimes I got to have a suit on, or I might sometimes I go with the blue jeans on, hat to the back, you yeah. know? And, and when I got the suit on, I had to say, well, wait, man, I'm from that way. And, I'm, <laughs> and ain't nobody took my lunch money. Uh, you know, I came, I had three older big brothers. Hey, trust me. You yeah. know what I mean? But I figured it out and started to listen. But that connection, I think you're making with these kids is saying, I am you, man. I've, I come from now. I'm not nobody that's coming from no movie or some different area. I grew yeah. up right here, man, and made it out. So is that one of the connections that you utilize when you're interacting with the kids? So that's, that's a two-part question for me. Okay. Because, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do with our program is – I wanted to have a program open to anybody and everybody who needed the program. I, didn't want, I wanted to make sure that, you know, if you were in the surrounding suburbs, if you, was on the, if you were in the inner city, you know, our, our program is so diverse. We have people from all walks of life in our program. And people ask me, like, well, how do you pick the kids for your program? I say, I, I do a blind pick. I stick my hand in a jar, and whatever 25 <laughs> kids I come up with are the kids that I talk to. You could be wow. coming from you could be coming from a sub suburb. You could be coming from I don't know what your walk, whatever your your financial situation is, but you're there for a reason. And so I give it to you, not from I'm from the hood and all that type of stuff. You know what I'm saying? I give it to you from humanity, and I give you my testimony, my testimony. If you relate to my testimony, if you relate to where I was and to where I'm headed, because mm -hmm. I'm I'm not that same person from back then. Okay. I'm not that same person. I'm not the kid who, if you pass me a book, I'll jump up and hit you in the mouth. I'm not that kid. You ask me to read something, I'll just punch you in the face. I'm not him no more. I enjoy reading. I enjoy, I enjoy all of that. So I'm coming from two different places. So you know what I yeah. mean? So I might want to talk about Shakespeare. I want to talk about, you know, I like Macbeth. You know? <laughs> you know, I, never read, I never read a gangster book in my life because I walked the streets. I've been around gangsters. I've lived around gangsters. I've been to some places where I've seen guys do all kinds of things and seen it happen to them. So I don't have to tell you about that. I'm going to tell you where that leads you, though, because you will be in prison or in, or in, the, in the graveyard, because that's the most wealthiest place, place on earth, the prison. I mean, the graveyard. That's the wealthiest place on earth. There's all oh, kinds man. of future dreams in that place. Yeah, cure for buddy. cancer is in the graveyard. Mm. That's, what it, that's what cure for cancer at. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's just two parts. I talk to whoever whoever's there, and I talk to them about you know, my life story and my testimony. And I'm glad you said that because, you know, some people may, you know, everybody can benefit from coming yeah. there. And, you know, I, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. So, yeah, right on for that. Keep that up. With, with, with the kids, Kali, um, I want you to go in, a, a little bit into, you know, what some of these kids have done um, since, since graduating from the program. Because I, I've had the opportunity to interview a couple of your kids um, and hear, hear about their backstories, what they came from. And, uh, it, it's just incredible uh, it was incredible for me to hear them talk about what their aspirations were after getting into your program based on what they were earlier in their lives. So give us an idea, you know, of some of the accomplishment that you have seen your kids go on uh, to, to have and, and, and some of the things that they are now doing in their lives after being a part of the program. So I don't want to leave anybody out or make anybody feel slighted. So what I will say is this, I've had kids, Two, I think two or three kids that they said were learning, had learning disabilities or uh, were unteachable. Mm. Now those kids are honor students. One of them graduated with honors but, and is holding down a job 
in a, in a, in a, in a, in a big organization, you know, a, a nice organization, I want to say a company, you know, and holding down a job, been holding it down for the last two years now. And this person that the, that the school system gave up said, this kid has a learning disability, would never learn. And then mm -hmm. the person went on to become an honor student after being in the program. We had another kid who said, they said he had a learning disability. He's graduated, now he's headed off to the military. We have uh, a couple other kids who are quote unquote uh, problem kids who are, who are now holding down good jobs downtown. I'm not gonna say what companies, but holding down good jobs downtown and getting paid um, uh, large sums of money. And these guys are younger than, way younger than me. Mm. And, and, Good, good jobs, man. They make more than their parents make now. Wow. <laughs> how, how does that, how, how does, when you think about that, you know, the, the way you've impacted these lives in that sense, you know, that completely altering, perhaps completely altering the course of, of their lives and changing the trajectory of, of their path. What, how does that make you feel when you really take a step back and think about it? I'm, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good, but I know the job is not done. So I don't pat myself on the back at any point in time. I know that, like I said, you know, there's a, there's a, a line of kids that are going down the same path that I was going down, ready to fall in that same hole. I'm just trying to block the hole to keep people from falling in it. You know what I mean, the, the work is not done. We don't do victory laps around the gym. You know, we just don't do that. It's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> Man, and, and, and parents, I hope you're listening. Uh, because, you know, one thing he's talked about, and he, he's letting you people know that, you know, don't listen to what they're saying your kid can't do. Don't, it, it, they'll, you got to tap in, man. You got to get involved. And I think that's what's helping uh, you, Kylie, because you're involved. It's like, no, you know, don't sit there and listen to that, man. You dictate what your life is going to be. You dictate, uh, you know, whether you'll be successful or not. Not nobody else. So for parents that's listening to this, tap in. Tap in. Don't just sit back and let a teacher say your child can't learn or they this disability. Tap in, man, and push your kid and hold them highly accountable to move forward and, and be successful in life. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that I, one of the things that I've been on lately, you know, I've, I've seen it now, you know, up close myself. Like, I'm seeing kids still in the 12th grade that are reading at the fifth grade and fourth grade level, and I'm mm. trying to think to myself, like, <laughs> it's 2020. How is this still happening? How is this still? How are you still passing kids along? And I think it's time to start holding some people accountable. You know, as parents, we take responsibility, but we have to hold some of the people that we're paying to do these jobs responsible too. You know, yes. I mean, you're getting paid. Please explain to me how did you pass this kid to the next grade? Right. Got to hold exactly. people accountable. Kali, for other for other business people out there, um, and, and you know, this something you said earlier kind of made me think about this. You know, with some of the kids who others had given up on, but you you saw something in them that others didn't. Um, how much of your message to other people in business, you know, if you're having a conversation with an entrepreneur, um, would be about seeing opportunity or finding opportunity where others don't? Because a lot of people, you know, they try to do the, the copycat thing. Um, you know, they see another successful person or business and they say, I can do that. I'm going to do it better. Uh, but, but you, you know, you, you try to find these hidden gems. How, how much of, of conversations or how much of what you talk about kind of relates to that, seeing that opportunity where somebody else does not? Um, I look at stuff as teachable moments. You know, I think of everything as a teachable moment. If I have a, an employee or, or a coworker or a volunteer, you know, I think of it as teachable moments. If I see a person that has potential and they're going down, you know, they, they're just about to take the curve the wrong direction or something, you know what I mean? I sit down and I try to teach them from what I've learned over the time that I've been on this earth and what I've seen, you know, other people go through. And I say, listen, you know, you might want to reconsider that. And think about this. Even if you know if people ask me all the time, they say, "Man, you had a guy at the gym who was the top fighter. You, 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 you know, you, you had him. Why would you let him go to somebody else?" I said, "Because I couldn't take him to that next level. He was a better player than I was a coach. He was a better mm -hmm. athlete than I was a coach. And for me to hold him close to me would be disastrous to his career. So you know, so if I see somebody who has potential in something and they're at the gym." I say, listen, let me introduce you to this person. They could probably take you there. People are like, you giving away talent. No, I'm not. You know, those people will come back later on and help another kid out. Or they'll help another adult out. You know, but if I try to hold this person so close to me, you know, have them working here, it's a dead-end job. Mm. Why not train these kids for the future? Why not train them to be the best engineers or, or strategists out there, you know what I mean, to entrepreneurs? You know, just follow your heart and follow your passion, man. And for me, I see when I see a person who has some potential and, and passion, I try to encourage them to be the best 
a version of themselves that they can be. You know, and that might not mean staying with us. It may be moving on. But I have to be willing to make that choice. Because it's not about you. And, and you can't you. fake that. You cannot yeah. fake it. And that's why you don't mind sending them off. And, hey, spread your wings and fly, young bird. It's like – it's not about you. Other people, like, I see it in AAU basketball, and I see it in sports all the time. They're trying to keep these kids next to them or my kid, my guy. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not your kid or your guy. You know what I mean? Let them go. And, 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 and your whole focus is to – and that's what I love, man. You can't fake this, Kylie. And I right. wish you guys could see this big smile on his face when he's talking about these kids, man. Like, you can't fake that. And – Man, just just keep it up. But 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 my point was, it's all about the kids. It's not about you. That's why you don't mind letting them go. Yep. Do you do you, I got to ask you, and I'm just curious. Do you consider yourself a salesperson? You know, because you, you know you guys are a nonprofit. I mean, you depend on donations. Um, and I and I know that you know you're out there, you know, pounding the pavement, um, trying to get more people to help your cause. I mean, so I, I don't know if you do consider yourself a salesperson, but if you do. Um, you, you know, what's your, what's your strategy there when you're, when you're making a pitch? How does, that, how does that whole process work for you? Well, for me, me personally, I don't get out there and sales pitch. I don't, I'm not the salesman. I'm not, <laughs> it's not, that's not my thing. I like to do the work. I like to be in there. Oh, you know, people see me out. They, they pull up to the gym. They see me out there still cutting the grass. They see me painting. They see me sweeping the floors. You know, for me, I want to do the work. I'm in, I'm, in the, I'm in the thick of it right there doing the work. But we have a great team of people who go out there who build connections and and relationships with people in the community and the people who are, who are capable of giving to the community. I mean, giving to the cause. Uh, you know, we have people who, who've been donors for 10 years now, and these guys may only send a check for $5 a year. And it's just like a million dollars to the organization. You know, it may be $5 to one person, but that might've been his last $5. And, you know, we have a couple of people like that have been doing it for 10 years, not just sending five bucks. And I appreciate those guys as if it was a billion dollars. You know, so I'm not the salesman. I'm, I'm just doing the work. You're, you're there in the trenches every single day. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, no, and I, I, I know – I'm sorry, Mateen. I was just going to say, I know that you guys had, had big plans for this year, uh, but obviously the pandemic has kind of thrown a wrench into that. Uh, you, you had this five-year plan uh, to, to expand and to serve 250 more students. We talked about, you know, all the kids that are on the wait list. Uh, so so give, a, give us a sense of, you know, what these past several months have been like for the gym and for the program at a time when – um, a lot of businesses are squeezed and a lot of, I'm sure your donors are in, are in tight spots themselves. Yeah. So one of the things I, I've told my staff and I've told the kids in our program, I say one day the strong going to be called on to protect the weak. And this is one of the things that we say almost every night at about 2.40, I mean, at about 6.45. 6.45, you're going to hear me say one day the strong going to be called on to protect the weak. I say, man, you got to have a strong mind and a strong body to help your neighbors and your family and loved ones. You have to be prepared mentally and physically. So when, when the COVID thing, when the COVID thing hit, we just kicked right into gear. We took all the van seats off the van. We started sending food, not just to the kids who are in the program. We started sending food home to the family members because it's not, it makes no sense to send food home to just one kid when he has five other siblings who may not be old enough to be in the program or maybe too old to be in the program. So we sent food home to make sure the whole family was fed. We made sure that we sent hand sanitizer home and masks and uh, schoolwork packages home. And we did everything virtually, you know, we started doing virtual workouts. We just kicked it right into gear, and we didn't miss a beat. We just stepped, we stepped right into it, you know? I mean, we were as prepared as you could be for a pandemic. Mm. Adapting. Kept, adapting, yeah. Mateen. That's what they did, right? Exactly. Adapted. And, and, and it's that, um, you know, it just make, a winner will find a way to win. And, 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 and that's what I just see in, in Kali. It's just like no matter what, this is going to happen. We're going to make this happen. Okay, COVID is here. No problem. Problem. You know, now we're just going to know how to navigate through it. And um, that's great, man. And I got to ask you this question because and I know you, you said there was a few people that, you know, young men and uh, women, I don't know, uh, that's working and making good money and doing great. But <clears throat> did you have a situation where you had like almost that you had to hold them tears back? You don't have to say names where it's just like, man, you know, you saw that kid come in and struggle and but they finally got it. And they went on to do something and, and you guys had that interaction and it was like, you know, you had to hold those tears back. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, we celebrate every milestone, you know, we walk this path and this journey with these kids. We celebrate every milestone, you know, and um, every time I see a kid go across the stage, it's an emotional moment for me. 
you know, because I feel like, you know, I feel like we are family, you know, because we, we spend a lot of time. Eight to 18 is a long time to spend with a kid. You know, you become family. You know everything about them. You know the family. You, you eat together. We do meals together where we bring the families in. We eat together. We go volunteer. We do volunteer. That's a big part of being in our program. You have to do community service. We have to go out and do work together in the community so everybody buys in. So you get real close. And so every time a kid goes across the stage, man, it's a, it's a, it's a teary kind of moment for me. You know, so it's not just one, it's every time each and every one of them go across there. So, yeah, I've had those moments quite a few times. <laughs> how, how have you, uh, how, how would you say you've changed over the years, you know, being, being the leader of the program, Kali? I mean, has, have the experiences that you've been through with the kids and the things that you've learned from them, has that, has that kind of shaped the way that you approach things or has it kind of been consistent all the way through? No, it's, uh, you know, like I said, I, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm still learning right now. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm 50 years old, but I'm still learning. You know what I mean? I, I'm learning every day. Um, these kids have taught me a lot. You know, at first I was a man without purpose, and you know, now I have a purpose in life. You know, a person, a man without purpose is a man that's lost, you know, as far as I'm concerned. So these kids give me purpose in being, and the fact that their families trust me and trust me with their kids to make sure that they're doing the right things in life. So I have a purpose and a goal. So, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm constantly learning because I want to be the best version of myself for the kids and for our community. I don't want to be the best version so I can get some kind of award at the end. I want to be the best version for the people who trust me and the people who look for me to make the right choices in life. So I'm always trying I, to I, 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 know you, I know you don't do it for the awards, but I got to bring it up because as we're, as we're here on the Zoom, uh, we see it right behind you. You were a finalist in the 2017 <laughs> CNN Hero of the Year Award. We, we can see it right there. Um, when, when you sit back and think about where you came from, uh, and like you said, you didn't even know if you were going to live to be see your 21st birthday to accomplish something like that. Uh, what does that what does that do for you? What, how does that make you feel? So it makes me it, it makes me feel good to be a part of a team because there is no CNN hero without my team. It's, that, that doesn't happen. You know, we've got tons of awards, but that doesn't happen without the buy in from the community. You got to think those guys who sent the five dollars. It don't happen unless the guys sent the five dollars. It don't happen unless the van drivers go out and pick the kids up from home or school, you know, and then be late there at night. Or it don't happen without the teachers and the tutors and the volunteers who come in there day in and day out for no money or little money at all to make that happen. So there's it, it makes me feel good to be a part of a community of people who care. And that's that's how I got to answer that one. When is the book coming? When is the movie coming? Right. <laughs> I don't have time to write one, but I wish I could. Man. I wish I had a ghostwriter, somebody that could, could put it together for me, man. Yeah, I could. I see it. It'll happen. You know oh, what I mean? It, it would be, yeah, it, it would be Oscar-worthy stuff. Yeah. Uh, Kali, you know, I, I also want to ask you, you know, for other people out there, certainly you have found your niche to make an impact on the community you're in, in the city of Detroit, and on, on all, all these kids that you, are, that you have helped and they're still helping. What's your advice for other people out there who may be looking to impact their community? And it could be, you know, in a completely different way. You know, if they're sitting down and saying to themselves, man, I really want to do something big and help people out in my community. What would your advice be to them as far as the, the, the way they should approach that? Um, I think they should approach it with, uh, with, 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 with their heart, honestly. You have, your heart has to be in it, you know, because there's no um, guarantee that you're going to find funding right off the bat. You might have to make some sacrifices. You're not going to make sacrifices for something that you don't care about or that you don't love. You know what I mean? Because that's, that's why a lot of guys start and they stop. They start and stop because they realize that they don't love it as much as they think they do. You know what I mean? You know, so I'm not saying everybody should be homeless like I was or lose, <laughs> lose close to 60 pounds or more, you know, in, in a short period of time. But you have to be passionate about it. You're going to have to make sacrifice. I was at the Entrepreneur of the Year Award. And one of the things that I, I heard a lot of those guys say was like, no, it, it took a lot of sacrifice. I couldn't make it to all the birthday parties. I couldn't make it to all the this and that. I couldn't make it to that. And when I was hearing these guys at this entrepreneur award, I'm thinking like, man, you cannot get anything without some sort of sacrifice. You have to sacrifice that playtime. You have to sacrifice that downtime. Because right now, you know, you have to be getting yourself ready for the next step or evolution in your, in your career path. You can't be around goofing off. You know, some people sleep too much. I'm up at five o'clock in the morning. You know, I want to win. I'm up at five in the morning. <laughs> you sleep. <laughs> I, I was, if you get out of bed at one o'clock, I'm already up on you. I, I, I was gonna say, so, and, and something tells me when you get out of bed, it's like you're ready to go. It's not like a gradual wake up process. You like no, come I'm out of the go. gates hot. I'm on go, man. I'm ready to go, man. I want to win. I don't like losing. I'm up. Yeah. 
That positivity, man. It's just gleaming, man. And is that something that you uh, spread, you know, throughout and encourage your kids, you know, to have that positive mindset? Because I think it is very important having that. Um, that's very helpful when you're trying to, you know, be successful in life. Yeah. I mean, you know, we definitely talk about having a positive uh, outlook on life. You know what I mean? You can't have this doomsday perspective of everything. You know, I, I try to try, I tell people all the time, like, try to find the 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 the, the, the sunlight, you know what I'm saying? Try to find, don't be stuck off into this gloom and, and, and despair all the time. You know, look at this from this perspective. Look at it from this, from this angle right here. You know what I'm saying? And see where you can find your way through. You know what I mean? Don't just be all, oh man, I can't do it. Well, if you say you can't do it, I've read this now. If the man who say he can and the man who say he can't, they both right. If you say you can't do it, you most surely cannot do it. <laughs> but if you yes. say you can, it's a strong possibility that you can. Don't find an excuse, find a way, baby. That's right. I like that. <laughs> hey, hey, Kali, a, a, as much as you have helped all these kids in the program, uh, how much have they helped you? You know, how, how much have they helped you? Not, not just, you know, as the, as the person who runs the program, but as a, as a man, as a, as a person. Um, like I said, I, I didn't have a purpose in life. You know what I mean? Somebody created a narrative for me a long time ago. They, when they said I was going to be there in jail, you know what I mean? I took that narrative and I ran with it. I said, man, why waste time? I'm, on, I'm not going to be here that long anyway. So I did anything and everything under the sun. You know what I mean? I was just just recklessly playing games with my life. And somehow I was spared that. You know, I was spared that. So for me, I have to give my testimony to these kids. You know what I mean? Because I was spared from a lot of the, you know, stuff that happened to a lot of other my friends and stuff like that. But the way that they helped me, like I said earlier, they gave me a purpose to live. You know, every time I see a kid and he, he comes in the, co in, the, in, the, in the gym and he says, coach, I, man, I'm having a bad day. And I can sit down and talk to him and see a smile come back on his face. That gives me a purpose. You know, I'm, I wake up every morning with a purpose. I know why I'm here. I'm, I'm there for a reason. You know what I mean? So they've given me purpose. And I appreciate the kids for doing that. And I, I, and I appreciate the community and the parents for allowing me to do that. So, yeah. Hey, but, but before we let you go, uh, I know there's a – big national contest going on right now that that the gym is a part of so uh you guys need some votes so tell people out there how they can do that to help you out um they can go to our website uh, and, I, and it skips my mind right now i got you dbgdetroit.org so yeah they can go to our website and uh, get the information and, and vote it's a uh, it's a uh, about uh getting another van and a van is definitely needed you know like i said we got over 1300 kids on the waiting list and a big part of our success with these kids is being sure that they can make sure that they can get to the program and get access to the help that they need to be successful human beings. So getting them to our program is a big part of it, you know, especially with the COVID now, you know, it's, it's less and less kids can be on one van at a time. So we definitely need other means of transportation to make sure that they make it to the program and we can give, give them the support that they need. Come on, people. Come on, people. We got to help get this van. Come on, because we keep making a change in this world we need that van baby let's go dbgdetroit.org go vote and Kali sweeney thanks so much for joining us uh, great great conversation uh you have an amazing story you continue to do amazing things even in the face of the pandemic and all the challenges that has brought um no pun intended you guys just continue to roll with the punches uh <laughs> at the downtown boxing gym a lot of that uh, credit goes to you, but I know you would say it's all to your team. But nonetheless, thanks so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me here. Keep inspiring, baby.